Hi, my name is Steve Gazemer, otherwise known as Necklace Steve. Not sure why. Uh, name given to me by Medi. Get his last name right. Uh, Sadagadaga. Sad. <clears throat> Sadagargal. Medi Sadactyl. Medi. You know the Electro Boom guy. You know the guy who's always blowing himself up. He's trying to teach you electronics at the same time. Check out his channel. You'll love it. Welcome to my garage. I had a lot of people inquiring lately about how I took this image, and this image, and this image. All of them were taken in this garage with this setup I'm going to show you now. So there it is in all its glory. I know it doesn't look like much, definitely a DIY project. Um, this video I'm going to go through all the different pieces, hopefully you'll understand how I built it, and maybe you'll be motivated to build one yourself. So without any further ado, let's get started. Some of you may not know what a double drop is, so let me try to explain. First, here's a slow motion video of a single drop. So when the drop hits the water, initially, a crown is formed. You've probably seen pictures of this before. When that crown collapses, a column of water in the middle appears. That's called a Worthington jet. And now for the second drop. If at the peak of the Worthington jet, you drop a second drop and it hits the top, it smashes and you get this cool umbrella effect. Here's a few slow motion videos of the double drops. As you can see, it's very variable from one drop to the next. begins with the water drop solenoid right here. Basically it's just a valve that opens and closes really quick to let the drops out. It's kind of like the heart of the system. Then to control all this we have a microcontroller circuit board. It's kind of the brain of the system, controls all the timing of everything. Uh, you have a, a reservoir of the fluid up here, kind of like an IV bag really, feeding the heart. And on all the action haps down here at the bath of water, which is kind of like the toilet of the system and then of course we have the camera and flashes to take the pictures of what's going on in the toilet. Let's just get rid of that analogy. I don't think it's working anymore. There's one more key part to double drop photography and working in the garage in general. I always have good beverages with you and snacks and just in case you're wondering. And I'll go through each of the components in detail hopefully give you some tips and tricks on how to optimize your home system. So let's talk about the reservoir. You would think you just need any kind of container, fill it with liquid, with a straw on the bottom, and away you go. The problem with that approach is as the water level drops, the pressure from the water decreases. And that means with the same timing, you'll get smaller and smaller drops. You'll have to constantly adjust your system to adapt to that. So what we do instead is we create what's called a Marriott siphon. A Marriott siphon is a way that you can keep the pressure of the water constant even as the water level drops. I've created this system by just pieces I bought in Walmart. Um, this is just a, a, a drink box you can buy there. It has a straw and of course it's already sealed and everything so the kids don't spill it when they use it. So it's a perfect starting point. So the drink box I got from Walmart, the nozzle I got from this container here, cut it off of this that I found in a dollar store. And the hose is fairly cheap just from Home Depot or any other hardware store. See if you can see inside here. I don't know how well you can see that. So I've used some latex caulking, tape, whatever it takes just to seal this off so it's watertight. So as for the liquid that you use in double drop photography, mainly water. Uh, but there's all kinds of additives you can put in there. Of course, you can use food coloring. You 
And I've used old pop bottles just to store the fluid for when I need it next. As you can see, you know, I've got blue, red, I've got several other colors back there. <clears throat> One thing you'll notice is that there's quite a bit of food coloring in here. For the water drops that go into the reservoir, it needs to be quite dark because you're really dealing with a very small amount of fluid. So if you want the color to show up in the photograph, it needs to be quite dark. The next thing you might want to consider for your fluid that goes into your water drop system is a thickener. I've used guar gum or xanthan gum. You can buy these online, many different grocery stores carry them. You need just a very little bit of this into uh, say a two liter, two liters of water. You probably want to heat up the water, put the about a quarter teaspoon of the xanthan gum or guar gum into it, and then maybe mix it up with a blender or something. The end result may look something like this. You can see it looks a little bit milky, but only you only use a very small drop and most of the time you've got some food coloring in there anyway, so you don't really notice. So the benefit to the thickener is your images will get a lot more uh, globular look to them and not quite so scattered and drops all over the place. You get more of that stringy look. The drawback is that because it's thicker, your drop height, your Worthington jets may not be as tall as they would be otherwise because the water's a lot thicker. So another additive, perhaps a little bit of some kind of detergent. This is what I've used. And what this does is it decreases the surface tension of the water. And if the surface tension gets reduced, that's really what limits your Worthington jet height. So a little bit of this will go a long way to make your Worthington jets a lot taller. Generally, you just use that in the bath and you won't need it into the into your reservoir, but that's something to experiment with. Now, of course, the drawback to the detergent is it creates bubbles. So if you want bubbles in your, your fluid, then it's not a problem. Sometimes you're looking for that real clean look. It can be hard to get rid of the bubbles. I haven't quite solved that problem yet. If anybody has any suggestions how to get rid of the bubbles, please let me know down in the comments. I would love to hear. And no, I didn't paint my fingernail. Stevie's got a boo-boo. All right, let's move on to the water drop solenoids. So the water drop solenoids, basically they're just an electrically controlled water valve. It opens, it closes, that's all it does. The special thing about these is they open and close very quickly. Now, typically, um, I'll have water drops, so this opens for about 20 milliseconds. So about two hundredths of a second it's open and then it closes again right away. I think a lot of the water drop systems that are out there use the Shaco PU220AR DC 24 volt water drop solenoids available on eBay for about $40. However, when I was building this system, I used the, as you can see here, the AirTac Type 2V025-08 DC12V from eBay. I checked, you can still buy these, they're about $12 and they're cheaper and I'm cheap. So this is what I used. Unfortunately, you'll see here, I have three water drop solenoids. I used all three of them to take this picture. But now, only one of them is left working. The other two have crapped out on me. It's something I have to get to. Perhaps you get what you pay for. If you're building your own system, a couple things you want to look for. Make sure the voltage on the relay matches your system. These ones are 12 volts, which matches my system. The Shaco solenoids, I believe, run on 24 volts, so I'd have to modify my system if I'm going to change to those. These ones have an NPT quarter-inch thread. Purchase these nozzles at Home Depot and the hose, at, also at Home Depot, both for about five bucks. One thing I should mention, initially I had these water drop solenoids up much higher and the reservoir actually tied to the roof. My thought was that the longer the water drop goes, the taller the Worthington jet I was going to get. Turns out that doesn't really help all that much, so I've moved it back down to here. In addition, when you have that extra height, often what would happen is the second drop would actually miss the Worthington jet from the first drop. It took me a long time to figure out what was going on there, but here's a little expert tip for you. What would happen is one drop would go down straight, the second drop perhaps would, because of the surface tension, would stick a little bit to the nozzle and thus would drop just slightly off target. It would shift it over just a little bit, and after that long distance, would totally miss the Worthington jet. 
So if you find your second drops are actually missing the target, what you might want to try is some Rain-X or some other kind of water repellent. I just coat the no tip of the nozzle there a little bit, and then I find right after that, the next few drops hit dead on. Knowing this tip ahead of time would have saved me hours in the garage being very frustrated. So, you're welcome. <clears throat> oh! Alright, here we are at the drop zone. <clears throat> this is where the, all the action happens. Basically, any kind of container, bowl, wine glass, plastic wine glass, the dollar store is your friend in this regard. All kinds of containers, depends what the look you're going for. You may want a nice low, flat, big dish to get more of that infinity look, or you might want to be able to see the rim of the glasses or the bowl in your picture. Here's a couple examples. The liquid in your bowl, of course, I tend to want to fill it up to the rim. Again, it depends on the look you're looking for. You can add food coloring to the bath to your taste. Often I'll have one color, maybe red, up in the reservoir, and I'll have it dropping into a green bath with a blue background, so I get that whole RGB look going on. Just keep in mind that you have very dark colored drops dropping into your possibly differently colored bath. So often you'll get four or five tries out of it, and then your bath starts to change color on you. So you may have to dump this out and refresh it several times during your session. The size of your first drop will determine how big or how thick that Worthington jet is. So depending what you're looking for, you may want a larger or smaller drops. It also depends on the, how good your macro lens, how close your camera is to how big you want that to be on the screen. There will be a limit to the size of the drop you can use. It depends on the thickness of the fluid, and it also depends on how long you have the solenoid open for. There's going to be a limit to how big you can make the drop, because once the solenoid's open long enough, that drop becomes a stream, and as it falls, it'll split into several drops. Now that'll give you some unpredictable results. It may be a cool effect, so you may want to try that several times and see if you get some good results. As I mentioned before, adding the thickness to your bath will help give you a bit more of a smooth look to your drop images and a bit more globular look, but it may slow down the water, so again, you'll have to experiment. Adding the detergent to the bowl, again, this is what I used, can make a big difference in the height of your Worthington jets. It'll also make things a little bit more chaotic because it reduces the surface tension. So again, you can have a lot more variability, and a lot of times you get some very interesting results. This tip of using the detergent I got from the Ultimate Guide to Water Drop Photography ebook. Highly recommend it. All kinds of tips in there. Probably more than what I'll cover here. So well worth getting that resource. Now the background and the floor, what's surrounding your double drop image can have a big effect on how effective your final shot is. In these cases I've used stripes. I find stripes or patterns refract nicely in the, in the drops and the water columns. So that gives a nice effect. I've got a piece of glass on top of green foam core for the base. Of course, the foam core, the dollar store is your friend. Inexpensive and very colorful. You can have all kinds of effects. You've got all kinds of options. I don't know how well this shows up in the video, but you see most of my backdrops have all kinds of drops all over them. Of course, when you're doing water drop photography, there's lots of splashes. You end up with lots of dots. Uh, you only get a clean background for the first few shots. You may want to have multiple backdrops, so once the backdrop gets too wet or too splashed, then you can put another one in, start over again with a clean background. One more thing that I found out is I noticed when I was using my lens ball, doing some water drops on top of the lens ball, I actually needed to put some sides to my backdrop. It's not just the backdrop, but the sides. Because of the ball so round, it reflects, and I could see the wood from my frame refracting through the ball. You can see that in this image. So adding colored sides to your drop zone will help remove that effect in your lens ball. All right, now we'll talk about the brain of the system. This is what controls all the timing of the flashes, the drops, the whole thing. It's a stack of printed circuit boards. I designed the bottom one myself. The top boards I just purchased off of the interwebs. Now you can buy pre-made systems out there. 
that will do exactly the same thing, but they're probably more reliable, probably got a better user interface, come with a manual how to use it, quicker, easier to use. Other than that, they're identical. The board on the bottom is the one that I designed myself. Schematics and PCB files I'm willing to share for any of my Patreons. The microcontroller board is a Nucleo board from ST Electronics called the Nucleo F401RE, about $20 from DigiKey. The LCD board is actually a shield for an Arduino I bought from Deal Extreme, again, for probably about $10. There's nothing special about this combination of boards that I've used. There's all kinds of microcontroller boards out there available. The Arduino, the BeagleBone, any of those boards would be capable of doing exactly the same thing. So if you're more comfortable using one of those systems, it'll work just as well. The bottom board that I designed really serves as an interface. So there's transistors to interface to the solenoid to switch the 12 volts on and off. Then there's dry contacts running to the flashes and the camera to turn them on and off. Beyond that, there's potentiometers that the microcontroller reads in so I can change the size of the first drop, second drop, and the time between the two drops, and I can change the delay from when you hit the button to when the flashes will go. I won't go into any more details of exactly how the firmware works. It's a bit beyond this video, but if anybody's interested, feel free to ask questions, and if you're one of my patrons, I'm happy to share the source code with you. Of course, the source code comes with no warranties, promises, given nor implied, strictly as is. Take it for what it's worth. quick note about the camera setup in general before I go into details about the flashes. In typical photography, it's the shutter and the camera that actually exposes the sensor. But when we're doing double drop photography, the action happens so fast, the shutter and the camera is not fast enough. So what we actually do is we do it in a dark room, all the lights are out, the camera is actually in bulb mode, and the shutter can be open for up to half a second. Shutter opens, you do the drops, the flashes are what freeze the motion. The flashes have to be very fast. As you can see in my setup, I'm using two flashes. You could probably get away with one, just depends on the lighting effects that you're after. I find that the two work very well for filling in and eliminating shadows. However, in some setups, I find it would be very useful to have a third flash to just to light up the background itself. As the action in the, the water drop happens very quickly, your flashes have to be very fast. I'm using the Young Nuo speed lights, a 563 and a 564 and they're rated for about 1 20,000th of a second when they're set to 128th power. Now, when you increase the power, if you go all the way to, to full power on these flashes, the flash is 200th of a second. That means the flash lasts a full five milliseconds. Now, that whole second drop splashing event only takes about 10 milliseconds. So you can imagine if you use these at full power, you would have half of that full motion in your exposure which will be way too slow and your top drop will be all just blurred out. So you need to limit the power of the flashes that you're using. Typically I find I set these about 1 32nd is about the highest power range I'll use. If I go beyond that then I'll start to see blur in my images. One more point I'd like to make about using flashes. If you're using transparent liquid, which is usually the case, often you've just got a little bit of color tint in it, typically you want to focus on illuminating the background and the background will get refracted through the liquid to get your final image. If you actually put milk or something into your either your drop zone or in the reservoir, then the liquid is more opaque. Then you want to set up your flashes to illuminate just like you would any other kind of object. Almost any camera and lens combination can be used for this, but there are a few requirements. It's best if the camera has a bulb mode so the, and a remote shutter input, so the brain of the system can control the camera. If it doesn't have a remote shutter, you could still make it work as long as you have a bulb mode or you can set the exposure to about half a second. You got two hands, one hand triggers the camera, second hand triggers the double drop. Manual focus capability is the other key to the system. And of course in a setup like this, there's no time for the camera to auto focus. So you do have to pre-focus the camera. I like to use a ruler and then I can measure, I can see the seven is about in the middle of where my drop's gonna happen. So then I focus on that. Once you've got the focus set, you can leave the lights on in the room and take a sample picture. That way you can see a preview of the depth of focus. You probably want at least one, one to one and a half inches in front and behind of your center of focus to make sure the whole drop is in sharp, clear focus. Depending on your lens and setup, 
you may want to creep up your f-stop so you get more depth of focus. I've been known to creep up to about f-16 or even f-22. I know this has other issues, diffraction issues with sharpness, but it is a bit of a balance. Either you sacrifice some sharpness or you sacrifice your depth of focus. Depends what's more important to you and your image. Always use the lowest ISO in your camera if you can, that way you reduce noise. I always like as clean a picture as I possibly can. Some people like the noise, then you can creep up your ISO, that's just personal choice. You could probably get away with using almost any lens for this type of photography, but it just depends on how big the splash is going to be on your sensor, how far zoomed in you want to be, how close you want the camera to your subject. There's all kinds of videos and tips on how to do that, I won't go into details here but probably any lens you own now will suffice for your first pictures. Then from there you can decide if you need to get different lens. I've been using my standard 18 to 55 kit lens that came with my Fuji camera and it seems to do the trick. I can focus close enough and get the camera close enough that I get a reasonable size on my sensor. Every lens has its own close focal point. Generally you want to move as close as you can to the subject while maintaining focus. So just experiment what you have. I think a macro lens would do a much better job I don't have one. Remember, I'm cheap, so I do with what I have. So there it is. That's my double drop system, my DIY double drop system. Uh, it doesn't look like much, but it did the job for me. It took me a long time to, from the initial idea to actually get the whole system working, to get the first double drop picture that I ever took. You can see it here. Nothing special, but it proved that the system worked. It took me about two years, but of course I have a day job and other stuff, so I didn't have a lot of spare time. And at the time that I decided I didn't even own any flashes yet, so there was a long learning curve to get up to speed to figure out all the different parts of the system. If there's enough interest, I may do another video showing the actual setup, the actual taking the pictures, and maybe some post-processing of these images, how I approach that kind of thing. If you have any comments or questions, let me know down in the comment section. I've put a whole bunch of links, any information that I've had or any other useful resources down on the doobly-doo, so please check that out. If you've learned something in this video or found any of it interesting, please boost my self-esteem and hit the like button down below. Better yet, if you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and boost my ego. If you really want to support me, go to my Patreon page and boost my bank account. If you like my liquid photography, I do have a 2020 calendar you can buy here. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Facebook. 